you're listening to the Ricky and Clyde Wrestling Show. Listener discretion is advised at all times. for downloading and listening to another episode of the Ricky and Clive Wrestling Show, part of the Social Suplex Podcast Network. And to any of any of our American listeners out there, I believe it is Happy Thanksgiving time tonight. Am I right, Ricky? Not sure if you'll know this or not. <laughs> yeah, I think we all know it. It's Happy Thanksgiving, guys. I hope you're all stuffing your face with turkey. And, and, en- and enjoying the NFL. Uh-huh. I'm not an NFL. I don't even know how to spell NFL, so Ricky and JR are your guys for that, if you ever want to have <laughs> any questions for them. So, obviously, we're joined by Ricky tonight. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well yourself. I'm all right, thanks. It's been a a roller coaster of emotions as far as WWE is concerned, but before we get into the nitty-gritty of it all, I just want to have a wee quick shout-out to Velveteen, Velveteen Dream for his takeover performance on Saturday night. He knocked it out of the park for me, and when I realised he's only 22 years old, that, that was just ridiculous. Not sure that, have you been keeping up to date with their story at all, him and Alistair Black? I actually have, um, and I found the, like, the post-match sort of things kind of interesting where Alistair Black finally said his name um, uh-huh. so yeah um, that was actually the first time that I've seen a full on match of his mm-hmm. very very impressed I, th- I think I texted you that morning saying he's going to be an absolute superstar and I was saying the same thing to John Ross um, so yeah I was really really impressed with him um, he should have a very very bright future I really hope he does Um this whole say my name th- thing that was done masterfully and I know that every time there's a takeover it's always a shout of that being having the match of the weekend I think it's definitely in that argument but it wasn't just a wrestling showcase that was a character showcase from him on Saturday night there um, but his wrestling skills are really good for someone who's only 22 years old he's, he's very strong he's athletic he's, got, he's just got a good ring presence about him, it doesn't seem rusty, and that DDT that he pulled off, I've never seen that before it's a Yeah, that was that was quite stunning, the thing is like, you've just said the character work, nowadays like um, and it sort of harps back to when Bray Wyatt initially came onto the scene, that if your character is completely over, then it doesn't matter like, if your wrestling ability is on par with that like you can be like sort of like middle of the road average deep like average to good wrestler, but if your character is spot on like Bray's was, because uh-huh. Bray's in ring ability when he first came in, it was it was it was all right and never really stood out. But his character is what put him over the top, and his character is what what made everyone sort of like oh like um, be attracted to him. Uh-huh. So if your character's spot on, your character can get you over the top, but. When you combine a character with the wrestling ability that he's got, then he's got a big, big future ahead of him. Yeah, that is definitely something that NXT have been really good at over the last few years, the character work. You just mentioned Bray Wyatt there. And to a lesser serious extent, you've got Tyler Breeze, who had his gimmick fleshed out and nailed down to a T. Uh, but Pat, Patrick Clark, I, he, he's, I think he's the most polished article so far anyway. It just every mannerism, even down to the hairstyle and stuff like that. Obviously, it's a prince knockoff, and you could say he's the, in terms of the kind of character he is, the dominating, intimidating guy who's not afraid to flaunt his sexuality. He's the modern day gold dust, and I really hope. I, we talked a few weeks ago in the old podcast about. The NXT call up curse. I really hope that if he gets called up, that he doesn't fall victim to that curse. And it, you know, look at what Elias is doing on the main roster. He's doing well for himself. So maybe if they got Velveteen Dream up quickly, then it could work. So we'll see what happens there. 
See, I would be in sort of no rush to bring him up because at this moment in time, I don't know if you can fully trust Vince and everyone else up there and creative to know what to do. So for me, continue in NXT for for a very long, for not I wouldn't say a very long time, for at least you know a year, two years or whatever. Uh-huh. Continue working your character, get better in the ring, and just improve. And then you hope when you eventually you do come up, they know what to do with you because the last thing you want is him to make sort of like a sudden impact and then all of a sudden just starts falling down a ladder and then you've lost a potential superstar there. Uh-huh. Well, we will talk about the powers of Vince and creative in a little while. But just a wee bit of housekeeping first. If you listened last week, you know that Ricky, myself and uh, regular host co-hosts Barry and JR, we have a wee pay-per-view predictions league where we basically decide or predict who's going to win matches at the pay-per-view and we've been keeping score since Fastlane. No, sorry. What do you call it? Elimination Chamber. So, at the moment, it's looking really tight. It's been tight for a few weeks now and JR's claiming at 50 he was late into the addition of the pay-per-view league but Barry and myself are on 64 points and for the first time ever... Ricky has taken the lead with 65 points. How do you feel about that? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Don't <laughs> Try not to sound so overjoyed next time. <laughs> I'm quite disappointed in my picks. I went for... Yeah, you made some questionable picks. Well, there's only two questionable picks. And they were very questionable. I wouldn't say the Miz was questionable. I felt it was, but it, uh, but surely though, I should be getting at least double points or two extra points for my main event prediction. Two. I said KO and Sammy would run in, which they did, and I also said Triple H would pedigree Kurt Angle. You, if I remember correctly, you did say that you would. I want the predi- my prediction is Sammy and KO to run in, and Raw to win. That was a single point. Alright, okay. Would, are you disgr- Maybe I did, but anyway. Are you disgruntled? Would you like me to add an extra point? I've got the. No, not at all. I'm quite content being top at the moment by one point. I'll take that for now. Okay. So there we go, Ricky. Enjoy the lead while you can because this not getting a bonus point will come back to haunt you in the near future, I hope. Perhaps. So let's get down to it then. With regards to Survivor Series, overall, seems like from a percentage point of view, WWE knocked it out of the park. It had seven matches. If this, see if this pay-per-view had like a Rotten Tomatoes rating, it would be verging on and around the 90% mark. I thought, I thought six of the matches had really good wrestling. Charlotte Natalia was, uh, sorry, Charlotte Alexa Bliss was a wee bit botchy, but it was still exciting to watch. Some of those matches had really good wrestling. It was the f- and it was also like the first universally accepted excellent match from Brock Lesnar, probably since Punk four years ago, and there wasn't any do- dodgy booking for over three hours. And we'll get to the main event in a while, but Ricky, taking taking that main event out of the equation, how did you feel about Survivor Series up to that point? Yeah, the same as you. Um, I'm not ready to call it like an all-time classic or anything like that. Um, I felt it was a very good pay-per-view. Usos and Bar was really, 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 really good. AJ Styles and Brock Lesnar uh, was also really good, considering the type of matches we've saw Brock having recently. So, and I says in our chat, and I also says to John, I think I might have said to you, or I certainly said in the chat anyway, that <coughs> the Brock Lesnar-AJ Styles match was very reminiscent of, in my eyes, just the storyline, the way you were getting vibe, etc. It was Punk and Brock Lesnar. Just in the sense that you hoped quote-unquote the underdog would win, but Brock Lesnar was always in control. Never really looked like he was ever going to lose it. I know there was a couple of those. AJ got uh, more than enough offence in, just like Punk, but you always had that sort of undertone, undertone line feet, uh, under, sorry, that underlying feeling that Brock was still going to win. Which, which, fine, we can sort of accept that. So the match itself was good. Um, I, I, 
I feel like we've always been quite harsh on Brock, so I kind of disagree in the sense of what you say is that you'd need to go back to the punk times where I had a bad match because I can't just a couple of matches ago, just what was that fatal four way? Well, singles. He, ma- sorry, I should specify singles match. Well, I think his last two singles match before Braun were quite good. You know, you had the one with Joe, which was fucking excellent. We all loved that. The one with Goldberg at Mania was like that was just ten minutes of absolute pure chaos. It was excellent. Um, I actually enjoyed the the Taker matches as well, but the first one, um, the second one was probably the best out of three. I think maybe. Um, so I think we've been slightly harsh, and I think I want to just quickly say is that I think I haven't seen. I think Brock Lesnar is the best seller in the WWE. Without, um, without a doubt. But he sells so well, and to be honest, in both of them, they, they both of them sold really well, and they both of them performed well, so I really enjoyed that match. Um, so yeah, overall, pay-per-view was, was, it was good. I really, really did enjoy it. I don't know if Brock was like blown up or gassed, but it seemed to be quite a couple of botches in there, but I don't know if that was just Brock selling the fact that he was he met somewhat of a match because uh, there was a couple of instances where AJ went for a tornado DDT and Brock just threw him backwards it's as if it wasn't planned that way but I think that actually added it gave the match a, a scrappy feel and, that were, um, and it added to the underdog feel to it like a, re- a right <laughs> scrap between each other the bit, the bit where Brock was literally dragging him by his hair like from one side of the ring to the other um, was it looked quite painful to be honest, uh-huh. uh, but it also just gave that that impression. It looked, um, you know, it's he is the beast, etc. And he, he was literally ragdolling AJ around everywhere. But, um, just to quickly say something else, I believe I called the finish to this match as well. What was it you said again, John? I think Jr. said something along the lines that he'll go for an, a phenomenal forearm. And he'll miss, and then Brock will turn around and grab him and give him an F5. But then I says he's going to go for a phenomenal forearm, and Brock's going to catch him mid air and hit him with an F5 to finish it. And that's what happened. That's um, really, so finish was good. The finish was actually it was really good. Um, Brock done well to control him right enough. Um, I New Day Shield. It, for me, the first cut, first five minutes was just it was just like right, get going, get going sort of thing. But then it just all exploded and. and so many great moments in that match. It was a great way to kick off the show. Uh, I I was texting John Ross during during it, um, and we got to I think we got to is it it was either three on two or four on two for the raw in the, the women's five on five. I can't remember what it was now. I text John Ross and says that right, it's time to eliminate Sasha and make it a four on one with Asuka. <laughs> oh, that would have been good. And, and then just have Asuka destroy them one by one. And I know that might have not been good for the SmackDown women, but your biggest threat, Becky Lynch, which was a bit of a shocker, a stunner as well, was out first. So to me, like you were, it was going to be Naomi, Carmella, and you had uh, Natalia and Tamina. Like, only one of the four that I don't want to care about, and only one of the four is a good wrestler, um, <laughs> in my opinion. So it wouldn't have mattered how the other three came across. So, but I, I thought that was a like that match. To be honest, was just all about going to make Asuka look strong as hell. And so did. she came out all guns blazing. She looked really fired up for it. Mm-hmm. I thought Natalia looked good as well. Uh huh. Um, so I, it was just. See the, sorry, on sorry, you go. On you go. No, on you go. Sorry, sorry, you go. <laughs> it was a the bit that I didn't like was Naya and Tamina. They were back and forth, and it just looked. You could tell they were. It's not fair to say, but you could tell they were out of shape because they were blowing, blowing wind very early between each other. And I don't know if that was what they were trying to portray, but it just seemed like, oh wow, these guys don't seem to be doing well at all. So I wasn't bothered that Nia Jax got eliminated early with the count out stuff. That I thought it would be like a double count out. Um and I I'm I, I think I've said it before, I think Nia Jax is actually improving. I kinda like her. Um She is but And I must admit, I must admit like I did enjoy that face off though between Nia Jax and Tamina. I did enjoy that. 
I enjoyed it. I was kind of waiting happens. for it, and it was just that whole Tamina was standing in the ring, and the sort of camera sort of panned around to Nia Jax, and you just saw her in the ring, and I thought, like, I quite enjoyed that sort of that little face off. Tamina did have a good showing after Nia Jax got eliminated, mm-hmm. I think. Uh, and I did like the idea of them facing off, but it was just, oh, s- speed it up a wee bit, please, can you? But as you say, that was all about Asuka, and m- I was, I was quite sort of edge of seat stuff when Asuka came in. She was laying those kicks in hard, doing her, her ass bump, whatever it is, mm-hmm. with gusto. So it was really interesting. Asuka has been a, a firm favourite of the, the family when we're all watching NXT back in the day. <laughs> so it's good to see and this is retrospectively seeing what the competitive matches she had with Emma which I did personally like she should have been booked like this from the start um, a dominating force she's obviously had a lot of squash matches on TV recently as well so I think they're starting to get get to grips with what's going on here they did these squash matches with Nia Jax and Braun Strowman last year and they worked they worked tremendously well for Braun and it has worked effectively for Nia but Asuka's already an accomplished wrestler so I think they're on the right path with her now to and there's, she doesn't seem to be in the title picture at the moment so just keep her off and we'll see what happens on the road to Wrestlemania I'm hoping for big things from her mm-hmm. and see the I think I preferred the Shield New Day match over the Usos in the bar. The Usos in the bar was really good. I just think it was one of those ones where you see if you gave them a couple more matches then you would have got an amazing match I think. Just like they had with New Day and the Usos. Their matches were good though at the start. They started well but as it went on the chemistry increased between them all and then they came out with a couple of classics especially the Hell in a Cell match. So it's a shame that they're on different brands and this is one of the problems with this brand extension but a good showing from them but the Shield New Day that was really good I thoroughly enjoyed that one there was a specific point where Roman Reigns speared Kofi onto a pin attempt right at like two and a half or something that was mm-hmm. excellent I had jumped out my feet for that one that was cleverly done and then obviously the finish with the uh, Shield Total Bomb from the top rope as well which was was different, was new, which was it was it was quite cool as well to see. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, and, and we're being really positive, but there's that big fat elephant in the room at the moment. So, right, like, I don't know if you want to cut this off or what. Okay, right, the main event. I have bullet pointed some of the problems, okay? Number one, John Cena being there was absolutely pointless. Apparently it was for film promotion or t-shirt promotion. That shouldn't be why he's there. That was a waste of five, ten minutes from him. There was absolutely no point in him being there and that could have went to someone else like Rousseff or something. That was terrible. That really irked me. Not being happy with the Miz. Um, excuse me, that's terrible. I've not been happy with Cena since he's proposal carry on at Mania so that's one thing Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn's run in was pointless you could argue that it did have an effect but I don't think it did anything it was was also at the wrong time of the match and they were both bested by Shane when they had the steel chair I thought at the time I was thinking right so are they saving Jason Jordan's run in for after and then when I thought that I thought they've got the timing of this all wrong but Jason Jordan didn't even come down, which made his sort of veiled threat backstage segment pointless as well. And also, right, all the fresh talent were gobbled up early doors. Naka, Nakamura and Finn, they had good showings, but he, him and the other two, they were showing the door to make way for us another, yet another McMahon Helmsley family drama. It had a feeling of a Triple H burial about it. Not that he buried talent, but when all was said and done, all eyes were on Triple H. Um, Barry, Barry actually said, he just tweeted, what's that to Zero a minute ago, saying it felt like he was watching a, like a Survivor Series. The pay-per-view was brilliant till the last five minutes, but it was as if he flicked over to a Survivor Series from 2006. 
and I know what he's feeling. He's also put a tweet out in our wee WhatsApp group during the weekend saying Triple H noticed CM Punk getting hot, got involved. Noticed the Shield getting hot, got involved. Noticed Daniel Bryan got hot, get hot, got involved. And now he's noticed Braun getting hot, so he's got involved again. <laughs> Now, I'm trying my best not to associate Triple H with the word shovel here, but when is this whole Triple H stealing the spotlight going to stop? Surely in 2017 there's got to be a new a new incarnation of a heel adversary or a group of adversaries that have to be overcome by the baby faces. Why do they have to keep relying on Triple H when it comes to some, um, WrestleMania time? It happens too often and it's just, it's got to stop. Your thoughts? But I'll go through, I'll just address each bullet point that you made. Um, uh, I understand John Cena probably brought more eyes and more more pay-per-view buys or more de- network buys or whatever. <sighs> but fucking hell. Um, <laughs> fucking hell. That's he was literally say. in the match for like 90 seconds. We stood in the apron like you know what I'm more pissed off about the fact that he was in the match never even got a fucking we never even got a fucking a face off with Triple H never even got a proper face off with Kurt Angle other than that sort of that little bit like it was a more so it was like oh like if he was pointing his wrist it was like you know like, look at the times look we're here but I was I, fuck that like I just want you to stare at each other as if you want to kill one another <sighs> I, we never even got a sort of seen a Strowman face-off. Um, Cena being there was fucking pointless. And I know this is... That, this is pe- that, On you go. Sorry, your turn. That in the ideal world was Daniel Bryan's spot. But... You've got... Rusev on your fucking roster. And what the fuck is he doing? See this Rusev day carry on? Oh, I- Fucking hate it. This that guy is a fucking hero. <laughs> right? So to move on to your next point, the the younger quote unquote younger talent getting eliminated because it was just full of old bastards. Right? <laughs> and I love so many of them, but Nakamura goes out first. Bobby Roode follows him. And then it was Finn and Joe. I think that's how the eliminations went, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh-huh. <sighs> Fucking hell! That bothered me. Naka looked. They, they, to be fair, Naka's time in the match. They booked Naka strong. They did. He looked but that's, very good. That's, that was utter, utter fucking nonsense. Utter nonsense. Um, and then you move on to your next point. Talking about Triple H. I thought that would maybe happen after the match. Oh, sorry, no, you said Kevin Owens and Sammy. I agree, it was kind of pointless. Really pointless. Um, but at the same time, Shane ch- chasing him away with a chair, you could argue was he was distracted from Randy, and Randy gave an RKO, and then he was eliminated from a follow-up from that. So technically, you could argue, technically, they did sort of cause, cause him to be distracted or lose or whatever. But that's no, not the way I would have booked it. I kind of half expected Shane to be the last guy in the ring anyway from SmackDown because I was anticipating Keo and Sammy to come down and cause them to, cause them to lose. <coughs> um, but now moving on to Triple H. He's now... I don't know if it's him. I don't know if it's Stephanie. I don't know if it's Vince. It's now... Triple H seems to be that that now part time quote unquote part time guy who's an attraction at WrestleMania. It used to be Taker, where Taker would do one or two matches a year, but for a long time he was only doing one match a year and it was at Mania. And now it seems like Triple H just took that mantle. Which in a sense I don't mind so much in the sense that I think Triple H is one of the best of his year and one of the best we saw. I don't need to see your face and Stephanie's face plastered all over Raw again in every single segment, starting the show, ending the show, berating people. 
and just downright not even being those sort of annoying heels you want to see finally get beat up or whatever. Just, just like no, I'm fed up with you. I'm I'm done with this storyline. I feel like we've, I feel like this storyline has been rehashed. Not even rehashed, just been done over and over and over again for the last five years. But I will say this. Triple H may have got involved with CM Punk. It was only by the absolute greatness of him on the mic and in the ring that CM Punk was still able to stay hot and over. Because he should have beat Triple H the first time round. But Triple H beat him and he lost a lot of his momentum. And it, like I said, it was only because just how great Punk was and still is that he still stayed over. But I will argue this. Whether it was ever intended, whether they stumbled into it, or whether they were forced into it, Daniel Bryan having to overcome the authority made Daniel Bryan's victory at WrestleMania that much bigger and that much sweeter. It did. So I'll give Triple H a little bit of credit there, but like I say, they may have just stumbled into it or been forced into it. But it worked in the end. Triple H got involved with the Shield. The Shield beat Evolution. And they didn't just beat them, they put them all out. One by one. Uh-huh. Right? And I understand Triple H got involved. But we were then privileged to witness, arguably, one of the very, very best title runs we've we've saw in a long, long time in Seth Rollins. What is he run? <laughs> As champ. Mm. But he... He was putting on great matches, and he he was, he was doing a lot. He was he was he was at that point the face of the company, the number one wrestler in the company. And that at that point, it couldn't be argued. Um, so I don't want to criticize Triple H in that sense too much because having that Seth Rollins aligning with authority just fucking shot him into superstardom. But Triple H has got a habit of lining himself with people who get hot. Aye. And, and I, I, that's what I'm saying. I, I won't want to criticise too much because I felt, like I said, I felt with Daniel Bryan's storyline played out in the end perfectly. I think Seth, we were, like I said, we were privileged to watch. We were given a great run by Seth and that initially started because it's Triple H and him lined up together. But and, I don't need to see it all the time. And Seth's victory at WrestleMania this year was mm-hmm. a good story overall. But again, that mm-hmm. all started with Triple H getting involved in Kevin Owens' title win. Now, although JR can't join us tonight, I've not listened to this yet, but JR had a, a short audio clip on his feelings about Triple H, so I'm just going to play this exclusive for you right now before we continue. Fucking Triple H. Yeah, sure. this is a Why is it always about you? Why? I don't even think I can translate that for any of our American listeners at all. Do you know what, um, <laughs> Thanks, JR. Aye. No, I completely agree. But like I say, I just, let's just, there's been good times where Triple H has actually, where he's quote unquote jumped on someone else's bandwagon when someone else is hot. And it's it's worked and it's progressed that guy. It's, it's done wonders for him, but there's been a lot of times where you think to yourself, like, did you really need to get that win? I know. Look, did you need to beat Punk? Did Did you need to beat uh, Sting at Mania? Did you need the title at Royal Rumble? I suppose it added to the Roman Roman Reigns storyline, and or kind of somewhat forced into that. But did Did you need to? Did they need to beat Scott Steiner? Did they need to beat Booker T? Did they need to beat Goldberg? Can you see a theme? Do you know, there? so it's aye. I know what you're saying. I know what you're getting at. But and I, I, one more thing, the, and I want to try and end it in a positive, because in that main event there was very little. I say to you that for me there's a lot of too much posturing and not too much actually going on. It's just too. I didn't like it, but if if and it's a big if, the creative and Vince etc can somehow 
book Strowman the way they've been booking him and finally coronate him with somewhat of a title or some massive win, then at least something good has come from that match because at least Braun stood stood tall at the end. I just um, I didn't care though. I didn't. It didn't make me happy at the end. For me, it did just because it gives you that little bit of hope. They're finally going to be like, Do you know what? We we derailed his momentum when we when Brock Lesnar beat him so easily, and he's now got all that momentum back, and now he's a face. Is he a better heel? Is he a better face? Who cares? He'll just go out and absolutely destroy people. And I'm hoping. I, me personally, I think I said it on last week. I said it before. I might have said it off here. I think I would go Triple H, Kurt Angle, Royal Rumble, Kurt Angle, and Jason Jordan at uh, WrestleMania. And then uh, you probably need to go Triple H and Braun Strowman at WrestleMania because they have to have that match now. You can't have him attacking Triple H and then nothing really comes of it. I know. So that, that for me, that was, it's not even a saving grace. That was just the only good thing I took from it that I'm now hopeful that they might, they might just finally give him that big, big time win or that big title. Um, obviously, you can't hold, give, hold, have too much faith in them, but, you know, the entire people view outside that final, that main event was really good, was really, really solid. Um, Main event just really left a bad taste in my mouth, and it was, just, it was just a kind of sad way to end things. It overshadowed the rest of the pay per view to where I, I feel as if I can't enjoy it. But I think for me, that match should have went on last, which was fine. Maybe, you know, but maybe see if that match in Brock Lesnar AJ Styles have closed and they had the match that they had. I don't think we may not be making a big deal about it as well now, but I just think everything that happened before it. And then you culminate the pay per view with that. You're like, it just emphasised mm-hmm. just where the, where the head, where, where Vince's head or where Creative's head is just now. Um, yeah, it's very very questionable booking, and that questionable booking. This is a this is a divisive opinion. This one, but the booking continued on Raw, and there was something I wanted to talk about. But first of all, before that, Ricky, for the second time in less than a week. There was a title change between two of your bays. Last week it was Charlotte and Natalia, and this week it was Miz losing the IC title to Roman. How how is your heart doing? Well, because Miz is now going off to film, uh, make a movie. That's fine. He lost the title. That's that is fine. You know, so at least it's not just a case of like, uh, you know, we're just going to take off you, and then we don't we don't know what we're going to do with you. So in that sense, it's fine. You can sort of accept that. Because <coughs> um, Miz has done so much in the last sort of two years uh, for the IC title and the sort of that the whole mid card scene. Guy's been an absolute stable. He's been he's been superb. Really, he really has. In the ring, he's, his match have been nice and solid. Mike work, just flawless. So... See if, but, see if Neville was still around I would have named him MVP I know Neville is still up in the air but he's not been on TV for a good couple of months or so now and with that in mind The Miz is be- firmly becoming the MVP of the year the whole year mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you probably you probably have a close I think AJ Styles had a good year and you Braun Strowman will be up there as well. Uh, and now that you mentioned Neville, I wonder when he's going to come back if he does. But just going back to and I'm I'm part of me is wondering would you hold Neville's return off to the Royal Rumble? Maybe that's too far away, but who knows? Maybe we'll see. Um but going back to the IC match. I, <clears throat> um I love Roman. You know I do. Mm-hmm. I think his mic work's actually been quite decent recently. His in-ring work, people just want to overlook it and just pretend and act like he's not one of the absolute best in the company. Um, but he didn't need it. He, he didn't need the title. He did not need that title. Because um, people have got this idea 
the Shield reunion is all about to get is all about to get Roman over and make it all about Roman. And that idea that people have, it, it's true. Like that's reality. People can deny it if they want, but that's why the Shield is together. And in just the way they, like, I can understand when when the Shield came back the week before Survivor Series, Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose come out because Roman's been off sick. So he comes out and then there's this big buzz. But then even the promo videos to that Survivor Series match, it was all about Dean and Seth getting beat up, losing the titles. A big dog returns and then it's like, fuck. Just put him in the background for a bit. Just just put him in the background. Mm-hmm. Let him go back to kicking fucking folk in the group. Just put him in, put him in the back burner. People will sh- may, might slowly start to like him. He might start to go over. Quote, unquote, over. So, but all you're doing now is just you are making him front and face of the shield, and and you are just feeding into that idea that everyone's got that the shield was put back together to continue to push Roman over, uh-huh. to continue to get him over. And uh-huh. for me personally, I would have done it something like Shield could come out, cut a promo, or have a match with say uh, the Bar and uh, Small Joe, and then Miz comes out. Cuts a promo, blah, 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 blah. Open challenge, someone come answer it. And at that point, someone like Finn Balor should have answered it. I would have given it to Braun. Give it You could, uh, either or. You could have went with Finn, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then him and Joe could have feuded over it. You could have had him and Joe uh, feuding for it. Um, And that would have made more sense because... Because Joe, even though he's as great as he is, like that title would make him look even more legitimate if if that even is possible. Oh, I agree. And for Finn, and for Finn, for the first time since his return, you would be like, right, no, right, okay, finally we're doing something with Finn. Finally we're doing something with Finn. Um. They've give it, given it to Roman, and it's like, fuck, man, you should just... And granted, there was quite a lot of cheers when Roman won the title. That's just because the Miz is such a good heel. Perhaps, but they're still cheering them. They're cheering Roman, but it's like, come on, you don't do it, because don't you understand, by doing this, you're just shooting yourself in the foot even more, because people are going to resent them even more. I mean, but we've, we're, all, we're already... Convinced that you're going to go with Roman and Braun, uh, Brock, uh, Rum, uh, Mania, and the reason why Brock's destroying all these people and no one's kicking out of F fives is so he can make them look even bigger and stronger for when Roman, because when he finally hits Roman in F five, Roman's going to be the first one to kick out of it. See? Roman didn't need it. Bottom line, Roman, Roman did didn't. not need it. For me, someone like Finn Balor needed it. Well, you mentioned Finn Balor. Right, according to Dave Meltzer, and I will take that with a pinch of salt, right, because he can be wrong, we know that, but the original plans for the Royal Rumble event, which would see Finn Balor versus Lesnar, have been nixed. Apparently Finn is not considered over enough by, you know who, Mr Vince McMahon. You see, based on the, the dismissive nature of his booking over the past month, this news is hardly surprising. One night, they moved from a thrilling victory over Bray Wyatt, surrogate AJ Styles at TLC. Balor was unceremoniously crushed by Kane. And then in Raw, right after Survivor Series, which I had a decent outing, he was knocked out cold by Samoa Joe. Right, so that was just a wee excerpt from what culture there. Right. So Vince doesn't think that Finn's over enough. So, first of all, right... Vince is the one who decided to put Finn in a dead-end feud with Bray Wyatt, the eater of interest. Sorry, I know you're a Bray Wyatt fan, but not a, he's been booked into oblivion. Right, before you continue, sorry. Because he's been booked into that way, not because of who his character is and what he is, it's because of the booking's been that been the issue there. Okay, I'll accept that. Vince is the one who decided to have Kane bury the living daylights out of Finn with about 60 hundred chokeslam. Vince is the one who had Finn bow out early at Survivor Series so, as, so that his McMahon soap opera could take centre stage. The reason he isn't over, Vince, is because you're not letting him get over. 
don't drop him out to gain to Kane. Don't keep the ridiculous Bray Wyatt feud going. Have him have a good innings at Survivor Series. That's your doing. And until you show trust in the finisher faces to showcase their ability to the majority of a fan base who enjoy the small underdog story, then nobody is going to get over the way that you want them to. And this brings me... Sorry, right, I'm getting angry. <laughs> this brings me back to my point about the Survivor Series main event. I'm not going to... I try my best not to use the word squashed. Because, right, but each of the people I'm about to mention all had a good showing throughout the match. They all did. It looked impressive for these short bursts. But Nakamura, Bobby Roode, Finn Balor and Samoa Joe all got eliminated in very quick succession. Think of those names I've mentioned. They were all extremely accomplished wrestlers who were experts in their field before they even got to NXT. They were all NXT champions, all of them. Two of them had really long and very effective reigns with Finn and Rude. But they all had to be swept under the rug in order to make way for this story that's been done to death for de- nearly decades. Right? Four NXT champions get swept under the rug. That just... No wonder people aren't getting over. It's because Vince... You're just... I'm, see, sometimes Vince knocks it out of the park. He's knocked it out of the park with Braun. Kind of. That hit a big stumbling block with Brock Lesnar, but you've got to show faith in the new guys that are coming in. You've got to think of the next generation. Triple H isn't going to last forever. Shane's not going to last forever. Kurt Angle doesn't look as if he's going to last even another couple of days wrestling, which is a big shame to say. So, <laughs> sorry, I had to get that off my chest there. <laughs> right. So I'll say this. Finn was given a title, right? Immediately after coming up from NXT, right? Mm-hmm. He then got injured for no fault of his own, but I guarantee you that has stuck in Vince's mind since that moment. I gave you a title, I gave you a chance, and you get injured. I don't care if it was your fault, but you got injured. And you may not like the guy. The same happened with Dolph. Dolph beat Del Rio on Raw. And what my opinion was, probably the greatest cash I've seen. Oh, careful, careful. Uh, alongside Seth, it's, you can make an argument, right? Because and, see, and that crowd, that crowd was going insane when, when Dolph came down. See, that was a, a Raw after WrestleMania crowd, though. That's but a, that was that's the that was a hard that's the people that legit care about wrestling. They were going insane. That's Dolph was so over. Dolph, I think, got concussed at the next pay per view against Del Rio. Right, mm-hmm. and then nothing since. Dolph in the ring, people legit thought he was like a second coming of HBK. I don't think he's ever going to. He was ever as good, great. He's going to be as great as that. And the potential for that, but he had the potential to be just an absolute superstar for you, like an absolute, like legit one of the best in the company in the world had at the time. So I think Vince has had that in his mind, and and he's probably just thinking to himself that no, you're weak, you're physically weak. Whether that's correct or not, and I don't think it is because it's a one-off freakish injury. It doesn't looks, excuse the way he's been booked. I think You've, he looks... You like, see, so, go, on you go. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to agree with you. It sounds like I'm not going to, but I am. I'm just trying to tell you what I think Vince is probably thinking. If it's true, right, and we'll see, for right now we need to say if, because we'll never know if it is. Then again, we don't know because Finn did, did you see what Finn tweeted out yesterday or today? No. It was a picture of him and Roman, I don't know if it meant it, because it was Roman, he had Roman like in an arm lock or something, and in it, in it, in it he had written forever, but in capital letters were O-V-E-R. Oh, right. So, and, you know, maybe, right, let's just go on assumption that it's true. I 
apparently, what I've read as well, that Vince doesn't like his look. So he just comes out with a leather jacket on. And that's it. Well, all the people in the crowd that wear the... What are those face bandanas called? I don't know. They like his look. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Right? But didn't one of the absolute greatest of all times and probably maybe your favourite, if not your second favourite, did he not just come out wearing a big, long leather jacket? He did. We're talking about Mr. Copeland. Aye, <laughs> right? This is a fucking guy, Vince McMahon, who wanted to book Charlotte, the best female wrestler in the company, against James Elworth, James Elworth at WrestleMania as a transgender woman. <laughs> I heard that. That's, like... And, and you trust that guy to say who's over and who isn't? Not at all. You've got a guy in Finn who would be a fucking... would do so much business for you, would give, bring in so much money. He is he is over as anybody in the fucking company. He was over as fuck in NXT. It was ridiculous. Like, really? Even now, the amount Even... of wee kids that you see on Twitter dressed up as like the Finn Balor demon gimmick. I know. And I actually, and, I really enjoy when he's a human. See, when he gets really aye. aggressive, he's fucking captivating. Because you're, you're like... He's, he he's, fucking nearly killed Shane McMahon <laughs> at some Survivor Series. Who hasn't and, nearly and, killed Shane McMahon? And, and you fail to fucking see the potential in this guy. Even, I'm sorry, but the old man is potential losing it. I think it, there's, a, there's a faraway look in his eyes. <sighs> it's just... No, like, no... I you can't. I can't. Like, and I'm. I, you know, right? You know me quite well in the sense that when people go on about the indies and all this, it sort. You know that that sort of grates at me a little bit, as if that's like the cool thing and everyone should be doing. It. If you're not doing it, you're not cool enough. And Finn came from that sort of. He came from New Japan, etc. So he came from that sort of background where where a lot of people are now attracted to that. And even I can admit that this guy should be pushed to the fucking moon. And a push doesn't necessarily necessarily mean winning the fucking title. A push just means winning significant feuds. Uh, and significant feuds in showcase matches, like attraction matches, like Undertaker. <sighs> can you? Like you had the one. You, you had the one with AJ Styles, and then and then you have him fucking losing to Kane the next night. What the fuck does Kane gain from that? I and Braun get attacked for Kane. <sighs> I know they tried to make Braun look strong by walking away from getting his throat crushed, but for Kane... <sighs> Is there any fucking wonder why, why people like Cody left, why Neville's potentially leaving? Is there any fucking wonder why people like Kenny Omega are saying, nah, I, I'm, I'm happy in Japan, I'll be staying here for a long time? Is there any fucking any wonder why the Bucks probably have no, no interest in coming? Is there any fucking... <sighs> why someone like EC3 would never want to come back. Like, it makes perfect sense because you get there in in some... I don't know if it's a... like a pre... like a... like a, a thought or a... I'm trying to think of the word here. That um, like you're, you're, you're stamped as this and it doesn't matter what you do in his eyes and that's all that matters. You know, is there any fucking reason why New Japan is hot as it is now? Ring of Honor and how hot the Hindis are? Name the fucking, like... You get to go, you just get to fucking wrestle and it's just... You just get over on your own way and you get fucking... And you get all that love and that. And he can't fucking see how much he's over is 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 frightening. See, that's... You're right. New Japan, Ring of Honor, especially New Japan, they put on right good wrestling matches and... I was actually wanting to bring this up anyway. We have both watched the 365 documentary, Kevin Owens. Mm-hmm. One of our favourite matches at the WrestleMania was Kevin Owens' Jericho. Because yep. it, it was an intelligent, well-sequenced, well-thought-out, story-driven match. And Vince didn't like it. Vince was far away look, but no, no, don't like it, no. He didn't even give it, fair enough, he's busy. Didn't give an explanation. That documentary basically showcased an unhappy Kevin Owens. I know he had the title run, 
But then he lost it to Goldberg, and he, he could tell. He could tell he wanted to say more about that. And I think. See, see if you just want to see a man physically, physically and emotionally and mentally broken, and stood right in front of you. Just go watch that at that moment where Vince says no. Uh, your fucking heart breaks when you're like, mate. What fucking what match were you watching? I can't tell you how depressed I feel. <laughs> felt. <laughs> I would. I had watched Survivor Series Monday morning. Over the course of the day and the chats we all had in WhatsApp, I was feeling more and more pissed off with what had happened in Survivor Series. And I thought, right, I'll cheer myself up, watch some Kevin Owens stuff. And then I watched this documentary, and he's he's miserable. He's miserable for the majority of it. And although I did enjoy his SummerSlam match with AJ Styles, that that was a to do with a McMahon feud. That's why See, I just liked it. There's a there's an element of CM Punk to this. Punk was depressed as fuck in the last sort of twelve to eighteen months of his time in the in the wrestling, and he was so obsessed of this is what I want and that's it. This is what I want and this is what we're doing. This is what I want. Do it, do it, do it. And Owen sort of gives out that vibe. Owens just um I, I maybe he does maybe he doesn't but it just for me you get that vibe that you got from Punk just now but after he says it and then you go back and look at it and you're like do you know what ah you sort of have a point you can maybe start to see it even just little bits on TV and little interviews and stuff that you're doing just your promos were a bit more they had that that more that, that slight edge to it. Um, they are edgier, but I don't, don't think he's breaking. I don't, know, I'm just, I don't think he's breaking the fourth wall as much as Punk did. No, I'm, I'm, I was talking about Punk. I was talking about Punk. Oh, sorry, right. I think, I th- and also I think if you are someone like Kenny Omega or Okada, will probably never leave New Japan. John Ross has said that himself. I think to me before. And if you're Cody or whatever, you'd be a fucking nut job to go to WWE at this moment in time. I think. Because they, sim- they simply just cannot be trusted to treat you properly. The average Joe Bloggs that walks in off the street, they would love to do the performance centre stuff. Fair enough. Live your dream. But you're right, Kenny Omega, Okada. Look at what's his face. His name escapes me right now. He was in the Cruiserweight Classic for Japan. I've never watched it. Kota Ibushi. Mm-hmm. Um, he came over and did some stuff for. NXT in the cruiserweight, but he had no intentions of signing up full time. He's far too um, creative driven. Like he has like wrestling matches with blow up dolls and stuff like that. So and he does some crazy stuff. But I think he was nursing a bad, really bad neck injury at the time as well. Uh-huh. But you're not going to get people like him coming over, especially with what could potentially really break New Japan into the American market with the Jericho match coming up. Uh-huh. No, I don't see. I think they'll struggle to get bigger names now. They seem to have raked through most of the indies. Um, Adam Cole is the latest well, one, and I, he's not. He's not amazing. I don't see the big, huge fuss about Adam Cole. But who's there was, there? there was talk of Ricochet coming, but that seems to have died down. Maybe because. Uh, maybe there's some sort of contract or a clause that they can't sign just now. Because I know Adam Cole was supposed to be signing it, but he basically had to wait about three months before he could, so maybe that's the same case with Ricochet. And if you never saw Ricochet before, this guy's fucking phenomenal. You're devastating. And, uh, John Ross will, will verify that as well. It's just... To be honest, like I, I know Barry said it not long ago on our podcast before we came on to Social Suplex. Nice and I'm getting the same way, like... Really starting to get disheartened, and I'm now. Oh no! We've just joined a podcast network. You can't, you can't bow out. No, now. no, I'm not saying I'm going to bow out, but you get disheartened, and you just start to think like, can I be bored watching this anymore? Like, it's just it's frustrating. More than anything, um, nice. you have to call John Ross. He wants to come on. Oh, does he? Right, I'm going to quickly pause it while he comes on. We'll be back right after this short moment of silence. 
JR, welcome. Ah, oh, how you doing? How you doing, pals? <laughs> we are we are angry tonight. We are fucking venting and venting all over the keyboard. Basically, See, I think it's the same way that I feel. Actually, um, I was just like just went for a piss there and just came back and I'm like, what am I going to talk about? Like, what actually happened this week? And I was just like, that fucking entity, that Survivor series happened. <laughs> exactly. I just, and everything's a blur. Like, I don't know what's going on. We have covered quite a lot already, but basically, um, Ricky is handing in his WWE loyalty card. Oof. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying, it's, you get to that point where you seriously consider it when, when you watch what you're watching. Like, I am literally watching a storyline I've watched for the last five years. Um, you're watching them make the same mistakes over and over and over again with Roman Reigns. And I, I, and like we say, Miz losing the title fine, he's going to go make a movie. But Roman didn't need it. I love Roman. Roman didn't need it. Roman needs to be in the background at the moment so people just sort of, not so much forget about him, but stop booing him. And, and maybe they'll start to organically like him again. In the title, as I said, should have gone on Finn Balor because he needs it. He needs he. I, I don't know if this is the right word, but he needs to be relevant again. And now apparently he's not over enough, or he's not good enough, or whatever it is. And I, and I said a story to, to Clive Jr. before he came on mm-hmm. that to me the, the the reason it all stems it stems from Finn getting injured. It, the SummerSlam mm-hmm. when he won the title right and I, and I compared that to when Dolph Ziggler cashed in and he suffered a concussion like a month later against a, a, a DR lost the title and was basically on a downward spiral from there on What, what about you JR your thoughts on Finn Balor and just basically not people getting over and I don't really think that anyone like Omega Okada all the superstars from around the rest of the world would really want to sign with WWE at the moment because creative is a mess. I think like my take on it is like probably the same as you guys. It's like there's there's no point in any of these people that are in other promotions doing well to to come over like right now because you're you're running the risk of doing a fucking Hideo Itami and that's you over to two oh five and that's your level. You're never going to rise to that. They've done they've, the the things that they simple things that they do in NXT, like work. And I don't understand why creative's got to be so complex. Um, I think that's that's one of the the issues. And the promos are just the promos aren't like kind of like real language. It feels like everything's pretty like much like completely scripted. Um, there's no freedom for personality. And there's a limited amount of individuals on the roster who are allowed to get over because they get to keep their wins and, you know, that kind of shit. I think, like, they've missed the boat with, with Finn big, big time. Um, just making them job out to Kane, it's just like, what's the point? Do you know what I mean? Like, what's the point of doing that? So the, and, um, the point of doing that is so Glenn Jacobs wins his mayoral seat in Knoxville. I mean, really, to be honest, it's. it's <laughs> I mean, Kane. Kane is Kane is the most irrelevant wrestler ever. I mean, like seriously, like him and the Big Show. Like for the majority, if they're involved in it, and you're just like, cool, this is the part of the show that I can just tune out and just be on my phone for fifteen minutes. It's why? Funny. Why are they? Why is he jobbing out to somebody like that? I know. It's funny that Kane has been used for the majority of his career to put other people over. And now he's come in with a shovel and just laid waste to everyone as if he's this athletic powerhouse who can't be stopped when they know he can. Yeah, there's just too much history. I know. I mean, I feel bad shouting at Kane. Kane's a legend. He'll be, he's but, a he'll Hall of Famer, no doubt. But oh, it's not, let, let's, let's be honest, let's be honest. So let's say Finn beat Kane, right? Then a week or two later, Kane comes down and attacks Braun Strowman, right? Let's be honest, is anyone going to remember that Kane lost to Finn? No. But you're going to remember Kane beating Finn? Do, do you understand what I mean? I destroying mm. Finn. Like, there was no need for Kane to win. 
Like, you can still pretend he's a monster and stuff, even though you lost to Finn. It's no big fucking deal. Know, it's just, it's, it's crazy. Like, you, and, and going back, I know I'm going to go off a little bit here, but going back to the whole authority line, why can't you just do what NXT do? General manager comes down, has a little promo, makes a match, for, like, and, and leaves. Like, you don't need to be front centre of the show. You're right. Aye, just it's just you know what I mean. It's just it's frustrating. It's frustrating. There's so much potential, really, for like so many people, and like just they aren't being utilised in the correct way. Like I just I don't understand how they can fuck it up this badly, unless I feel that they're almost like intentionally doing it. Like it, it, it's starting to feel quite insulting. I have to say, I was quite, I'm quite annoyed. Not annoyed, but. I thought this um, Women's Revolution 2.0 that happened this week was a bit needless. I get it from a standpoint that with the May Young Classic recently happening, the NXT Women's Division's actually a bit cramped with a lot of women there and they've not got a lot of TV time. And another positive is, maybe apart from Ruby Riot, they didn't get rid of the top draws in NXT and they've still got the main ones that they want to do something with. Main, like sort of the main eventers, but there was no need for that. Barry had said that earlier on he texted again saying there are rumours that they're going to do a, a women's battle royal at the Royal Rumble, so maybe that's why they got more women up, so they've got enough bodies for a, a decent sized battle royal, which is fair enough. But the, the people that they brought up, some of them. Mandy Rose, I've seen wrestle twice, so I can't even remember how good she is. Liv Tyler's not bad. She's just like a sort of Carmela Light. Who else? Sarah Logan. She's alright, I've not seen much. Sonia Deville. Do you know that Sonia Deville and Ruby Riot actually had a really good match on NXT this week? I think Ruby Riot's the one that will... <laughs> I don't even think it matters what I think because creative will fuck her up but Ruby Riot's got the potential she's already she didn't really need to go to NXT that much so I think her time there was enough she's hopefully she'll do well but the rest of them minus Paige it was just bonkers I just didn't get it I don't see the need for it unless they're doing this battle royal but it's going to be cluster it's going to be far too many women there who already have limited segment time and match time it's just fuck's sake <laughs> it, it, it is good to see Paige back though and I'm glad she's put her demons behind her you mean Del Rio? It, del, el di- a cocaine a cocaine addiction <laughs> Alberto <laughs> El Diablo you mean get the gear mate <laughs> The gear, the old Colombian marching powder. Uh, so, her back injuries, her terrible relationship, her whatever addiction she had. So, hopefully, everything's going well for her, and we'll see something happen from it. But it's just there's already a I lot, think there's already a lot of women who aren't getting an opportunity on Raw and SmackDown. It's just really watering everything down, to be honest, isn't it? Uh-huh. It's like, like it's just it's going to be pretty crap because all you really want to see is just classic matches with like maybe like four or five lasses, just like we take them around. But twelve is that like is it going to be like twelve people? And uh, I don't know. I think it's, I think they've got about twenty odds, and I'm, I'm, I can't imagine they would do it in like the normal Royal Rumble, Royal Rumble structure because that would take up far too much time. I'd imagine they would just put all 20 in the ring at the same time and just have a proper normal battle royal. That would be, be a pre-show. To me, that's, it could be. Ah, that will never be on it. No chance that they'll put on it. That's like the first time ever they're sort of doing this so I, I can imagine it's going to be on the main show. But to me, it all carts back to did you really need to put the women on two different shows? Did they really need to do the two shows? All you had to do was just prolong stories over. Different... I know, but I think I think I think the counter argument to having two different brands is that 
I don't think you would have saw the emergence of Miz, the way he's catapulted up. You wouldn't have saw as much as, as shitty as title reign was. You wouldn't have saw Bray Wyatt with title. So there's certain things you wouldn't have saw. But I just, to me, it made sense to have the women on one show. Like, you are, you don't have that many great women wrestlers where you can afford to spread them out on two different shows. You've got maybe about five. There was talk of the, when they did the brand extension initially, uh, initially last year that they would have the women on one show and the tag teams on another. And I really, I've not got a strong opinion on the women, but see if they had all the tag teams in the one show, we would have had a good few bar Usos matches and stuff like that, and it would have been sensational. But again, I think the, and I don't want to keep as if I'm trying to. Like no, you, no, that's not true. That's not true. But again, the counter argument to be it would be: Would you have got Cesaro and Sheamus together? Because they were probably um, put together because the tag, uh, the tag team was uh, quite thin. But I agree. I would have now. I think now you can still do it. When next time we do the superstar shape up, all tag teams go to one div- one roster, and all women go to the other. But now that you've got about forty million women and half of them are shite, then it, <laughs> what's the point? Oh. Look, just give us Charlotte and Asuka and I'll be happy. That'll happen eventually. See, the thing is, right, though, see if they do this battle royale, mm. Asuka's got to win it. <laughs> oh, aye. Like, there's like, because that'll be in January or something like that, won't it? Mm. Aye, 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 January 28th for Royal Rumble is. So. Sorry, 29th, 29th. She would have to win it. Like, they're, they're not going to beat her at the moment. I think that's that's what's going to happen. She's doing the jobber role, just well, not the jobber role. She's defeating all the jobbers, so it's going to culminate in a Royal Rumble victory. Or if they don't do a battle royal, there's going to be a they're very rare, never seen before on pay per view, fatal five way elimination number one contendership match for the title, because that's a a very new, not used constantly trope that they use. I think uh, Paige will win that title and it could be Charlotte uh, asking Paige at Rumble. That would be alright. Uh, I mean, I, I think I don't mind either way because I think Alexa, Alexa Bliss has been excellent for the last year or so. That's a good thing about the Rumble out with the Royal Rumble match. You've got all the hipster matches that all the indie darlings get to see for the titles. So I like that, that they have things like that. Look at um, Kevin Owens and Dean Ambrose that cl- Belter last man standing match and also the year before that the triple threat with Cena Rollins and Brock which was just Oof. astounding who Oof. who do you think they'll go with to challenge Brock then at Rumble um, fuck knows it better not be Braun oh, if it is they better win it <laughs> uh-huh. I would rather see Roman and Braun at the Mania yep. than Roman and Brock I know JR yep. you are a fan of the Roman Brock match but oh yes <laughs> oh yes Just... I want, it's I... not over yet baby <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get it again but I I don't want it right now I want to miss it more very quick I quick. Genuinely don't, just genuinely don't know who, who they would have take on Brock at the Rumble a fucking Stephanie probably <laughs> Do you know what? Do you like see this the way we're feeling right now? We're ranting and we're no happy. It all stems from one fucking thing, and it's that main event in Survivor Series. It all went downhill from uh, there. It just went, exactly went downhill after that. It was like the fucking Wizard of Oz, man. He fucking it's the the pure. You know how everything's been amazing for like three months, and everything felt that it's leading up. No pay per view could be shite, and then they give mm-hmm. you like a really fucking like I would say like a. a Above average pay per view, and then just at the end, just like uh, here's like a dud match that doesn't make any sense. And here's see all these people that you like. Uh, well, they're getting pinned first, and there's Triple H fucking in the middle. Like, fucking, it's all about him again. Survivor Series was like the TV show Lost, started really well and was excellent for a few years. Hey, 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 I like Lost. I liked, I know I'm not finished. It started well and it peaked. And then at the end, when it finished, you're like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> they were dead all along. <laughs> Spoilers. 
Right. I think um, I don't know what you think, Jr. But I says to Clive earlier on that we might not be feeling this heat either. This pissed off if that five on five was sort of middle of the show and A game Brock closed because you could have just been like, at least we ended the pay per view on a high. But I think it was because we ended the pay per view on such a bad note after getting a quite a solid pay per view. They just can't do coronations like of like when they're turning somebody because like that's essentially what this is. It's a Braun Strowman like face turn, but they just Aye, they, like that. That just verified, just, what, just solidified uh, it. A face turn. Uh, that it's had to involve it's Triple fucking H. it's clumsy like that. It's just really clumsily done. It's like sometimes we like have things a bit more subtle. Do you know what I mean? Like instead of like oh, it's just Triple H and Braun here, do you know what I mean? Like, it's, like, it's, it's too fucking obvious what what they're doing, you know? It's like the big cast thing, you know, when they pushed, they were pushing him. If they wanted Braun to get over in a big bad way, what they should have done was have the Triple H cut angle shite happen earlier on in the match so they accidentally get each other eliminated. Braun's left with about three or four of the SmackDown guys and Braun just lays waste to all of them. That would have been excellent. It just—it doesn't even. It's not even a baby face and peril comeback. It's just a steps over the rope and just fucking destroys them all. Or one, one, one triple H hits a pedigree on Shane as he goes to cover him. Brock steps over the ring, gets face to face with Triple H, hits him with a running power slam, and then he covers Shane for the win. See the running power slam that he gave Nakamura. Did you see the torque on that bad boy? Oh, it was ah, he's, he's really good, man. He's, 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 it's unbelievable how much he's improved. It's, he's, he's just he's improving by the second. It's a joy to watch. And long may it continue. <laughs> and that's, like I say, that's the only thing that gave me satisfaction. It gives me some hope coming out of that match. Is I'm hoping now they'll do something with Braun. But at the same time, we're going to get at least we're getting some storylines as well from that match. Maybe storylines we're not going to want, but. Aye. Yeah. Just storylines. Even even Jason Jordan coming down would have been better than that. I would have right. welcomed that. Aye. I would have actually what got behind fuck? that. Did you, he, he, put, he makes some. Uh, Clive said earlier on, he did some promo backstage and then does nothing. And then He's moaning. Aye, and it was like. He is nothing. Like, just not. Like, t- like I, I think they will turn them heel. And I say that, I think I said it last week. I would go Triple H, Kurt Angle, some sort of uh, Royal Rumble, and then Kurt Angle and uh, Jason Jordan. Heel Jason Jordan at WrestleMania. I just, I don't, I don't really know if I really want to see Kurt wrestling at WrestleMania. Because no, no, I don't know. Not, don't want to see him I, wrestle again. I, I just, I think that he just looks really, really stiff. All his, uh, his movement is. And I just think, fucking, they're letting him in the ring. Like, like how come they're letting, letting, no letting Daniel Bryan come back? Seriously? I don't get it. That's a good, really, think, really valid point, actually. It is, but I think, does a, does a lesion on the brain not just sound that little bit worse than, like, having a neck surgery or whatever, I think? Apparently, um, uh, he's been going to like this concussion thing or like brain kind of like therapy, um, and it's improving like his cognitive flexibility or whatever. Uh, I can't, I can't remember he said, what he was saying. He said what he said was um, he now has the brain of a football player in college, but a player that's just come into college football. And quite that might not mean much to you, but John Ross will understand what I mean. So. Not, not too bad. Not not uh, too bad. Like you, exactly. you might have had like a couple of bumps, but yeah, that's Aye. that's fine. So, I think to be honest, but I think I can understand that their doctor's not clearing them. But even if Vince turns around and says not clear them, and the doctor says no, you get rid of the doctor. That sends a real, but it sets a real bad precedence. And I think on top of that, like in Vince's mind, and you some you have to agree with him, the the risk just massively outweighs the reward I know it does it's, it's not an easy decision it really isn't there is a risk but all it takes is one bad fall from Kurt and he's paralysed forever but just a simple bump from Daniel Perino, like just a simple a punch you and you fall back or just a clothesline like 
and it doesn't even need to be like a bad bump. It can just be like the safest bump you can possibly give him, and then that could trigger it. I don't know. It's just like I say that. I don't think you can criticize Vince or WWE for not clearing them. I just think it's yeah. it's just it's, it's far too risky for them. You can't criticize Vince for not clearing them, but it breaks my heart to see Kurt the way he is. He, he, did, he was trying to do the, the tandem German suplexes and there was one point where he couldn't even get back up I thought fuck he's done himself in here it's just I like, just hate to see people like that man it's horrible Like, especially guys I know we man. wanted it I know we all wanted it but like I, I'd be quite happy match at Rumble final send off man Aye. just you, you, his match would have to be a really fucking amazing storyline to make it work basically you know, like maybe a retirement match or something like that. Like, and you know, maybe maybe it's got someone to do with who he's been wrestling with, because guys like Cesaro, Sheamus, Braun, um, Shane McMahon, um, like these guys, none of the, even to a certain extent, Bobby Roode and that they're not like guys who are going to be flying around the ring taking bumps for you. Like, I think right now. Someone like like Seth Rollins and AJ Styles would be more suited to him. Someone who's a little bit lighter. Someone who he doesn't necessarily need to carry the match, but someone who if he, if he had someone if he had someone a German or a belly belly or an Anglo fan, someone who's going to bump like fuck for him. I think right now you should try and treat him the way Taker should have been treated towards the end of his time, with guys where you need to put him in with guys that are lighter and the guys that are going to like carry the match and do all the bumping for him. But yeah, uh, it's just. It's sad, man. Just that's I'm done. I was desperate to see him, and I got to see it. But I, that's it. Because I got a feeling that match with Triple H at Rumble or Mania just isn't going to be any good, and it's just Triple H. It's going to be... Triple H didn't look that good. He looked um, a bit rusty. Apparently, he's done a, a sprained his ankle or something like that. Um, so he's been really, really suffering. And he's got he's got a lot of matches coming up as well. Triple H, so you imagine he'll knock that rust off quite quick because he's got Jinder and then he's facing Roman Reigns in Abu Dhabi, Dubai. So and he generally does do sort of house shows, live events this time of year, building up towards Mania just to knock off the rust and get start getting into shape. Right, guys, it's been a depressing <laughs> night. Will we cheer ourselves up? Yep. How about a wee quiz time to end the show? Yeah, John Ross, are you sticking around for it? Ah, stick around, don't I? Right. right, here we go. That's me preparing it this week. Hold on a wee second. I need yep. a, because I'm very limited in my editing skills, I need a moment of silence so I can put in the quiz theme, which will come in now. It's fucking quiz time with Ricky and Clive and friends. A fucking WWE quiz. Okay, Ricky, tell us what the quiz is this week. It's just a quiz, guys. Just okay. a quiz. First, I need to double check how many questions I've done for you. Whoops. And it will go. I've got seven questions, so it's not a bonus one. Here we go. Right, Kurt Angle beat who for his first ever world title win? Oh, it's true. It's damn true. Go ahead. How apt is it that that's my buzzer? <laughs> uh, it was Dwayne the Rock Johnston. Sorry, it was just a rock. <laughs> <laughs> Right, question number two. At which pay-per-view was this at? JR, I, I do know it, but feel free to chime in. Oh, fucking hell, man. No, I don't know it either. <coughs> I don't think people... JR, what's your buzzer? Do people know what your buzzer is? Oh, boy. <laughs> yes, John Ross? <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it was a what do you call it? It was a SummerSlam. Right, moving on. That know. that that could be the bonus question, and I'll give you uh, clues for it, right? But I know the answer. How, can, I've got. Can I chime in? Okay. 
Oh, it's true, it's damn true. It was No Mercy 2000. Correct. <coughs> How many WWE slash WCW world titles in total has he won? Cut angle, this is. Oh, it's true, it's damn true. Go ahead. Six. Correct. I'm sorry, right. JR. Is that, true. Is that right? Right. Shane McMahon has won one title or two titles. So for this, you can take a guess each if he's want, if he's going to go different answers or he's can buzz in. How many titles has Shane McMahon won? One or two? One, and is it the hardcore title? Sorry, oh boy, one, and is it the hardcore title? And Clive, do you have a guess? My guess is two, and it's the hardcore and the European title. Oh no, he's, he's right, he's right. He is right in that, and turn answers my next question, which was name them. So you got that next question right as well. Thanks. Randy Orton has never won one of the quote unquote big four titles. Which one is it? Clarify the big four titles. The US, IC, TAG, and whatever version of a uh, WWE oh slash WCW title. Go ahead. Is it the US title? Correct. Yeah, I don't need to get granted. <laughs> in, or- in order. Whatever order you want, lowest to highest. Who has won the most titles? Christian, Big Show, and JBL. Put them in order. Whatever order you want, least lowest to highest, highest to lowest, whatever you want. Titles, titles. This is uh-huh. any title. Go on, Jr. I love your cat. I love your buzzer. <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> um, so I would go Big Show first, Christian second, and then JBL third. Would you like to hazard a guess, Clive? Was that your highest to lowest? <coughs> yeah, that was the uh, highest to lowest. Well, I'm going to do things a wee bit differently. I think from lowest to highest, it was JBL, Big Show, and Christian. Go wrong. It was you... Christian, Big Show, and JBL. That was highest to lowest. Uh, sorry, lowest to highest. What? Christian with the 20, Show with the 23, and JBL with the 24. You're, oh, the fucking hardcore title bastard. But he won, he won that about a million times, JBL. See, you <laughs> sneaky, he's sneaky. a He's a nasty quiz master. I don't like this guy. He always brings out this fucking 24-7 hardcore title rule. <laughs> what, he's that, just that, a fucking sadist, man. That was the greatest storyline in <laughs> professional wrestling history. <laughs> the hardcore, 24-7 hardcore title rule. That was fucking excellent. It was. It was so good that it burned <laughs> that title up and just made it irrelevant. And, and it was just like, I hope that never comes back. <laughs> that was excellent. Well, I loved that. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> nah, that was all. That's all. Well, at least we've got a smile on our faces to end the show. Shout out to Crash Holly. <laughs> That's disgusting. Shout out to Test. <laughs> oh for fuck's sake! Um, just shout out to the listeners and everyone on Social Suplex Network. Right. Yes, all the guys at SMC Podcast, One Nation Radio, One Nation Live, which you can catch on Facebook at twelve Eastern. I am not very clued up on the American time zones, but I think that's about tea time in, face, in England and Scotland yep um, just want to say John Ross um, I said earlier on about Finn Balor tweeting out a photo I don't know if you saw it but him and Roman Reigns yep so he had Roman in like an arm lock and in the caption he wrote forever and in capital letters he put O-V-E-R after this the report apparently Vin saying he's not over enough right so he put that out in, in capital letters with the words over <laughs> so uh, yeah. at, at nine at nine forty three, Finn Balor has tweeted out again a picture of him smiling with his beautiful smile and teeth, with a turkey that he's just cooked 
and he has put I am in capital letters I am not over cooking the turkey. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Lovely. Great guy. Finn Balor, the aggressive human version of Finn Balor. We love you greatly. Shout out to Mark Sessler as well. I'm just reading some of his tweets, guys. Some laugh. Who? NFL guy. All right. And join us next week for the Ricky and JR NFL podcast, sponsored oh, by Me Undies. Indeed. Me Undies, their amazing <laughs> underwear. On the Social Touchdown Podcast Network. <laughs> Social Touchdown. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Laces out. <laughs> Uh, feel free to rate and review the podcast on iTunes and or Podbean. Again, shout out to Social Suplex Podcast Network. Hope you're all having a happy Thanksgiving and try and look forward to hopefully a decent week of wrestling next week and we'll catch you then. Thanks for listening. Take care. Bye-bye.